Can I tell y'all a story about a man in heaven? I'm going to call him my homeboy. I had another, uh, one of my students ask me, why do you always ask, tell, tell us dead people, like, are your friends? Like, I'll say to homie Martin Luther King Jr., I'll say to homie Martin Luther, I'll say to homie uh, Aquinas, the homie Augustine, for if y'all don't know them, you know, you know, you will learn about them walking in your faith, and they're amazing men of God. And I said, because when I start to call them my homeboy, my friend, I make it, I make it a, a, a more important for me to find out who they are. When I address people as my friend, I'm placing them into this category where now I want to actually know about them. If I say historian, a theologian, man of God, it's like, it's not the same thing. It's not personal to me. So when I call you guys my friends, my family, I mean it. And I want to know your guys' story. Each and every single one of us is going to walk and run this race. And we're going to have stories. But let's make sure that God is, God is the one writing the script for us. And not our own, not ourselves, because usually ourselves get us into trouble. So the homie John Harper, April 12th, 1914, he set sail on a boat we all know. Titanic. Come on, somebody. <laughs> the Titanic. <laughs> now, this man was a man of God. He was, uh, he was from uh, Europe. He prayed all the time. Prayer was his thing. He, he, he would preach and he would go all, he was a traveling minister only in the, never eat, Eastern Hemisphere. So his first trek to the, to the Western Hemisphere to Chicago, he gets on the Titanic, this giant boat that even God can't sink it. <laughs> Redundant, huh? Now, you know what happens. Hits an iceberg. It sinks. Well, as it's sinking, he gets one little famous, like, spotlight in the movie. When they're, like, rushing to the boat, you see this madman running behind them. And he says, all women and children and unsaved to the boats. His story is told by eyewitness testimonies. He you know, so on the boat, he's running around. Finally, he has his life jacket. He had a, a, a young daughter. He puts her on a boat, and he says, we will meet again one day. We will meet again one day. The boat sinks. He's in the water, freezing cold water. And he's just, he's swimming to people. He says, do you know the gospel? And he's sharing people the good news of Jesus. Do you know the gospel? And, and when people would say yes, he'd just swim to the next person. Do you know the gospel? When, when they would say no, he would preach to them the gospel. And they would get saved right then and there. They would accept Jesus into their heart. And then he, he would swim. He swam to this one man. He says, do you know the gospel? And the man said, No. And he shared the gospel with him. And he said, would, would you like to know Jesus? Would you like to put him on your heart? And that man, that man said, no. So he takes off his life jacket and says, you need this more than I do. And he starts swimming. He's still swimming. He's swimming from person to person. But somehow the sickness, the cold, the hypothermia fogs up his brain. And he ends up at that man he gave the life jacket to. He says, do you know the gospel? The man says, no, shares with him. That man accepts Jesus. And to this day, the only reason we know John Harper's story was because that man became a pastor and was the last convert of John Harper because when John Harper turned around to swim to the next person, he sank and died. John Harper. You can look him up, Google him. In life, we're, we're, we're going to be in this race, and there might be people who don't know what they're in this race for. And we're going to share, and we're going to encourage them. We're going to be the Barnabas to their Paul. Because, see, I'm a firm believer that, praise God, that 
the anointing that God has to me is this roof. But the anointing that God has for each and every single one of you is my roof becomes your floor. It becomes your starting point. Because it, in the Bible, Jesus said, those who will come after shall do greater. Don't let no, nothing that anybody says to you shame you or hinder you. And there is going to be times where the attack of the enemy and the attack of the world are going to get to you. But that's why we need to look at these people. Imitate, imitate the homie Adrian as he imitates Christ. Imitate Pablo as he imitates Christ. Because that's how it worked for me. It wasn't some to-do list where I focused on the law. Okay, if I'm struggling with lust, let me never talk to girls again. Never let me see them again. I'm setting myself up for failure. Now, don't get me wrong. There is healthy ways to come about the law. But it wasn't until I started looking at people in my life who, who were walking this race, that were, that were running, that were that were moving, and when they started the fall, hey, it was, they were getting up, they were still pushing, they were persevering, but it's because they had Jesus in their heart. Jesus is what they were looking at. And that's what I started to look at. Tonight, I want you guys to, to, to walk this walk, to, to, to look at Jesus. In my life, it's, it's been a struggle. I'm a fat man that wakes up every morning and I got to look at myself in the mirror. Okay, I'm not a fat man. I'm a fluffy man. <laughs> I know some people are going to yell at me like, at, later. You shouldn't say that about yourself. <laughs> hey, man, you're right. <laughs> Back in high school, my name was Squishy Face. <laughs> that was my nickname. Squishy, squish, smush, squash, whatever. <laughs> I was okay with it. And it was funny because I was a lot skinnier than I was now. I still, you know, my face did not get really any fatter. It just stayed the same. Just the body got more proportionate to the head. You feel me? <laughs> In life, the righteous shall fall. Proverbs says the righteous man shall fall seven times, but he will get back up. I equate the only reason that I can get back up is because I can look at Jesus. When I can look up at him, I can get up. Because it's by his power, it's by his love. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is I want you guys to erase uh, 1 Corinthians 13 from your head. Because we're going to reread it. So if y'all could turn to 1 Corinthians 13. J. Val... Um, May I get you on the guitar, please? I don't, I don't know where J-Bell is. Oh, or, or, yeah. Uh, he's hiding somewhere around here. Uh, I'm going to do out of the ESV version. First Corinthians chapter 13. When y'all there, let me know. There. All right, we're going to start in verse 4. Paul, Paul writes this beautiful, 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 almost poetry of what love is. So we're going to start with that. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for the prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. 
I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as if I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's go ahead, stand up, let's stand up. First Corinthians 13, man, it's read at almost every wedding. Love. Just a few more minutes, guys, a few more minutes. I know the tushy's hurt. Love is patient. Love is kind. I wonder if it's ever going to be read at my wedding. A lot of people teach this passage as, as, as a checklist. But who's been unkind to people? Who's been rude to people? Who have we held grudges against? See, this isn't some ch checklist, some to-do list that we follow. It's something we become when we look at Jesus, when we love him with all of our heart, we become more Christ-like, and the Bible says that God is love. So we become kind. We become gentle. We are no longer rude. We are no longer impatient. See, when we're, we're unkind to people, who's in prison? The person that you're being unkind to or you? When you're being rude to somebody, who's hurt? The person you're being rude to or you? More often than not, it's, it's us. God is saying, run this race, look, and you will become the love. You will start to see people for not as what they've done, but like Barnabas, will see who they will become in Jesus. When Jesus said, you were the light of the world, the salt of this earth. He was talking to a bunch of lowlifes and scums, sinners, not saints. And it's not because of what they've lived up to, but it's what he saw in them. It's what he saw that they could become. And it's all because of his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his love, his passion, his heart, his, his undying passion. It says in the Bible that he will look at you with fire in his eyes. I imagine the most passionate lover when Jesus looks at me. No matter what I've struggled with, no matter what chains have shackled me to this earth, no matter who I was, no matter what mistakes I've made, no matter what people I've hurt, no matter what, what people I've steered clear of God, he still loves me and he loves you too. He sees us as righteous and we got to run this race. When we run this race, we got to look at him. We got to see his lies, his eyes. We got to see his presence. We got to see the authority that he carries. We got to see the humility of who he is. We, we, we all have our struggles. Can I get everybody to buy your heads? Close your eyes. For those of you who, who, who do not believe, I'm here to encourage you. Marinate on this, that you are loved no matter what you have done. That you can live in the grace that God has given you. That you are a son and daughter by birth and not by worth. It's not what we do that gets them to love us. It's what Christ and Christ alone has done that he loves us because of it. When we trust in his son and what he has done, he sees us righteous. He sees us blameless because what he sees is not a broken person, but what he sees is his perfect sinless son. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, he said these beautiful, beautiful Aramaic words. I broke a light. Praise God. I'll clean it up, April. Don't trip. 
He said these beautiful Aramaic words. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? According to Habakkuk, God cannot look upon sin. So when all the sin of earth was on his son, he had to look away. But when it was finished and his son rose from that grave, we now were alive when we trusted in him. And now even in our mistakes, God still looks at us with passionate eyes, the loving embrace of a father. So right now, I'm just going to pray for those who, who, who have never accepted Jesus into their heart. And you feel that tug. You feel God pulling you towards him. Do not worry about your past mistakes, your future mistakes, your present mistakes. When you trust in his son, his son's going to do the work in you. For he has started a good work and he will be faithful to finish it. Now that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. For and there is no weapon formed against us that shall prosper. We are the head and not the tail. His prayers for us are yes and amen. We are the apple to his eye. The centerpiece of his creation. If, if that's you, you've never had this relationship with Jesus. That you know that you feel it in your heart that you've been making mistakes. That you've been sinning. That you're a broken person that needs the loving embrace of God. On the crown of three, I'm going to just ask you to raise your hands. And I'm going to extend one more invitation. For those who feel like they've walked away. For those who feel like they've fallen, they've broken this tie, they've broken this relationship, God can restore it. He makes all things new. He makes all things fresh. His mercies are new every day. On the count of three, I just want y'all to raise your hands, and as a family, we're going to pray together. One, Jesus love you. Two, he bled, died, and rose so that you may have life once again. Three, raise him up. I see him. I see him. All right, I want everybody to just repeat this, this prayer with me as a family. Remember, guys, this prayer does not save you, but it's confessing with your heart, putting Jesus on your heart that he is Lord, according to Romans 10, 9, that will save you, God. So repeat this after me. Father, you sent your one and only son who was blameless, who was sinless, who could rightly judge us to die for us, to bear all of our sin, to bear all of our sickness, all of our shame. God, make us new. Make us brand new in your son. We, we confess at this very moment that your son is the Lord. Fix me. I am no longer broken in your eyes. Use me as a mouthpiece to your glory in the forefront of industries, an influencer of your gospel. Thank you, God. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name, and everybody says, Amen. Amen.